Ladies and gentlemen, if we could take our seats. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's session, um, Youth Civil Society Movements. Thank you for coming. I'm here to introduce the moderator for today. My name is Mabel Rubadiri. I'm a master's student here at the University of Oxford. I'm here to introduce our moderator, Kalud Kerr, who is also a master's student here at the University of Oxford. She is a master's of science student at the African Studies Center. Um, previous to embarking on this current degree, she completed a development studies master's at SOAS. She's also worked in the humanitarian development sector with several civil society organizations um, and development organizations, including the UN, both in Sudan and in other parts of East Africa. Um, and currently, she's working on a research project focusing on student-led uprisings in Sudan. So let's welcome Khalud as she welcomes the rest of our speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a quick announcement that our speaker, Vivian Onano, is no longer able to be with us. Um, and instead, we have um, Sizwe and Pofo Walsh, who I will introduce at length soon, and Koketso Moeti will be taking her place. So we're here to talk about um, young civil society movements. Um, and, there, and there are on the rise across Africa. And young people have used these movements as channels of political expression through which they can tackle issues such as unemployment and quote-unquote bad governance. Many African countries are grappling with failed economic and political social policies that have aggravated societal issues and made it difficult for young people to develop. The increase of youth movements across the continent is indicative of the fact that there's a growing call for social, economic and political change. Several successful and highly publicized movements, such as Fees Must Fall, have drawn attention to youth-led civil society movements. Inspiration has been gathered from the well-known events in Tunisia and Dakar in 2011. Anti-government protests have also been seen in Malawi, Sudan, Burkina Faso, and Nigeria in recent years. Therefore, this session will examine the reasons why and conditions in which these movements have developed. It will also assess the parallels and differences between them and discuss the main challenges they face. In particular, the session will question their capacity to have long-lasting impact with regard to the potential resistance of the political elite. Therefore, on my immediate left is Sizwe Mpofo Walsh. He's a, pursuing a DPhil in international relations here at the University of Oxford. Um, and he is a Weidenfeld scholar. He was one of the Mail and Guardian's top 100 youth, uh, young South Africans in 2013. And he is interned in the United States House of Representatives in Washington, DC. And has represented South Africa as a one young world ambassador at the summits in Zurich and Johannesburg. He's a hip-hop artist and producer, having, produ having released a number of singles and album nominated for a Cora All-African Music Award with the group Entity. He's a co-founder of the Inkulu Free Height, a young-led social movement created to deepen South African democracy. And on his left is Koketso Moeti, the executive director of Amandla Mobi, which works to run every cell phone into a democ democracy-building tool. She's also the national coordinator of local government action and has over the years worked at the intersection of governance, communication, and citizen action. Please help welcome me, I welcome you. <laughs> Sizwe, if you'd like to go first, please. Sure, thanks very much, Kulud. Uh, in October 2015, there was a gathering that could have been a gathering at any South African university. The only difference was there were jolly white policemen in brilliant neon jackets uh, who didn't at that time happen to be brutalizing the crowd. Fees must fall had spread all the way to London and about 350 of us were gathered outside the South African High Commission forwarding a message that had been forged in South Africa and bringing it right into the heart of colonial nostalgia. Well, we thought that was the heart, but I think this is probably the, the truer heart. Um, I've been debating whether they brought that portrait in to try and add some, some color into the room, but we're still not sure whether that's just a tan or whether they've actually 
added, but we're, we're, we're still debating. Um, but that, that was just one snapshot of something that I think has been happening and is right, happening right now, which is the movement of movements from Africa, and in particular instance that I'm speaking about South Africa and Southern Africa, right into the West, the UK, and the very epicenter of the place where the colonial ideal was imagined. And I think there's something quite different about how this has happened, and I think it should give us pause for some reflection. So it's about that process that I'd like to speak today. What does it mean to take a movement born on the African continent and impose it quite deliberately on a space such as this? So I'd like to speak about some of the interesting things that that brings about, but also some of the ambiguities and the tensions that it brings about, and hopefully that'll lay the ground for an interesting discussion here today. So it's interesting that we should be having this conversation at the Oxford Union, because that's partly where our story begins. Roads Must Fall was reaching fever pitch in South Africa. In April 2015, the statue was brought down, and a bunch of pretty crazy Oxford students decided we would bring the movement here to Oxford, and we would start Roads Must Fall in Oxford. And you can imagine we were greeted with open arms, and everybody was just waiting for us to spill the knowledge. So after a number of secret meetings in the Rhodes building of Oriel College, uh, we decided we would launch the movement right in this chamber at a debate. One of the people who was uh, there, Simukai, is with us, who is one of the protesters. Um, and the debate was over whether Britain should pay reparations to her former colonies. And we essentially wanted to do this protest and say, why are we even still talking about this? The fact that we are having this discussion uh, actually reduces the pain and the suffering of the colonial legacy. But really, we just wanted to start with a bang and do something that would get people talking. So we got here to the Union Bar, and there was this pamphlet um, for the pre-debate cocktail. And the pamphlet was advertising the debate, and it was called the colonial comeback. Uh, and the, the picture that went along with it was of, a, of black hands and shackles. And this was thought to be a tasteful, excuse the pun, way to celebrate the debate that was about to, to happen. And we had arrived to protest the debate. And when we got here and we saw the flyer, um, all hell broke loose. And we shared this on social media. Um, Many national newspapers picked it up, and the debate happened, and the protest happened, and the Roads Must Fall movement was born in Oxford, and has begun one of, if not the, central debate that's taken place, political debate that's taken place at this university, at least over the last five years. Uh, everyone from the chancellor of the university, Lord Patton, who told those of us who criticize Oxford's glorification of colonialism to study elsewhere, Otherwise, Oxford will become like China, uh, all the way through to Noam Chomsky um, and several other people have weighed in on the debate that's ongoing. But I think one of the most interesting features of what's happened in Oxford, and one of the things that I think has been under-discussed, is that this was a very deliberate move to subvert the traditional Eurocentric narrative that everything happens from the metropole and spreads out to the periphery according to the metropole's time and idea of when it should spread. And when starting Roads Must Fall, our idea, and I speak on behalf of the collective of students who, who started it, was to deliberately subvert that narrative, to take something from a place that Britain had colonized and to use it right in the heart of the place that forged that idea. And I think there's something quite interesting about the subversion of that narrative and what it means going forward for some of the themes that this conference will be addressing. Because all too often, and hopefully a bit later we can discuss it, 
these, na these narratives of Afri capitalism and you know, the neoliberal spread of innovation will you know, reach Africa and finally will catch up with everyone else, uh, too often go unquestioned. And in fact, in many cases, what's happening in South Africa, what's happening in Africa is ahead of what's happening here, is prefiguring what's happening here. And you can think of this in many ways. Uh, theorists like the Komarovs have spoken about this, but you know, Europe is now up in arms about austerity. Uh, hi, have you guys seen, any, heard anything about structural adjustment in the 90s? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Um, there are various interesting ways in which this idea of the subversion of that narrative, that things that have happened in Africa are prefiguring things that are happening in places like Oxford, in places like Harvard. And so I think that's the real challenge that Roads Must Fall places before us, is to, is to say a movement starts in South Africa and all the stuff that's on the cutting edge, all the narratives, all the discourse, all the methods are imported into a place like this and used here and actually start the debate here and start the debate again in Britain about how places like Oxford and places like Britain glorify colonialism. And it's those methodologies, for example, that I think we should, we should think on for a moment. Because obviously the way that Roads Must Fall in South Africa and of course in Oxford has been portrayed as you know, this group of um, neo-fascist Maoists who are intent on tearing down uh, the beautiful artworks of, of, of Europe. But I think one of the beauties of the strategy of a campaign like Roads Must Fall that we imported here, just to give an example of the kind of methodology, the political methodologies that were imported, is as you can see, there are literally thousands of things in Oxford that make you grimace and, and wince. And those of you who are here for the first time have, are probably getting that feeling like, wow, I'm in Oxford and my parents would be so proud. And then you look around and you're like, wow, they really took everything, huh? They really took everything. And, and you know you have this very complex relationship with the space. But how do you make that a campaign that actually forces people to reckon with the question? And I think the central in innovation of Roads Must Fall was to, and this really is innovation, uh, was to center a whole host of complex debates around a central colonial icon so that you could discuss those thousand things through the totem of one important symbol. And you could use that symbol as a symbol of the broader debate that needs to happen. And looking at what was happening in South Africa and in Africa at the time, those of us who were here thought, that's exactly what we can do in Oxford to get that debate started. Now, some progress has been made. As I say, the university's been embroiled in this debate for a long time, and for a while it looked like Oriel College was actually gonna take the statue down, and then they did a double take um, because a dictatorship of donors decided that removing, removing colonial iconography offended their sense of historical justice. Um, with no sense of irony. And, but other, other important strides have been made, for, for example, in places like Harvard, where a movement called Royale Must Fall uh, actually succeeded in getting the university law school's crest uh, being removed, directly inspired, again, by the movements that were happening in South Africa and in some communication with what was happening in Oxford. And of course, we've seen a wave of student protests happening simultaneously, but people don't often understand, also inspired by and symbiotic with what was happening in South Africa, happening in the States at places like Yale, at places like Amherst. Cambridge has also begun this, this conversation. So I think it's interesting to think of how this narrative that we so often assume to be good about how you know, progress is finally spreading to Africa actually needs to be completely upended and we need to speak about how important things that are happening or have happened in Africa are finally reaching uh, these shores. Now, having said that, and, and to end, I think there are some ways that we need to complicate that, that idea somewhat. Obviously, movements in South Africa have had their own complexities, and we shouldn't um, romanticize them. So 
many of the South African movements have met with challenges, they've been chaotic, sometimes even incoherent. But we shouldn't expect them to be coherent. I mean, in the 80s, you had Pan-Africanism fighting with black consciousness, fighting with African nationalism. The point is that there's an important sense of ferment going on in South Africa, not all of which is perfect, but which I think demands a great deal of our attention. At the same time, and as I say, there's that strange tension within one who comes to a place like Oxford and then decides to criticize it. And there is a tension there. Um, how can one both be at Oxford but then want to shout down the exact values that in many ways build this institution? But I think we need to think about this. As anyone at this conference, we're implicated in this difficult tension of being both part of these very troublesome institutions, but also wanting to make our own contribution. Um, and I think, quite frankly, who is supposed to do this? Are we supposed to sit back, come to these institutions, see them in all their problematic glory, and just keep quiet? Or when we get here and we realize these things, are we supposed to challenge them, even in very deep ways, even if that means we're somewhat compromised in the process for the greater purpose of advancing our view of what we think is justice. And in the, question, in the case of uh, colonial brutalization, there, there can be no more important cause for justice in these institutions. So I think uh, we need to have a sense of humility that we are somewhat uh, in tension, but I don't think that that should prevent us from saying the very important things and disrupting the very dominant narratives that continue to go unchallenged in spaces like this. Thank you. Thank you, Susie Kropitzo. So, um, oh, okay, <laughs> that's loud. Um, so, I, it's very funny to have me on a panel about civil society. Um, I have issues with the idea of civil society. When we exist in, in, in an oppressive system, we cannot expect those who are oppressed to be civil towards that system. And I think it comes from a deep sense of, you know, decorum, this idea that you will challenge me on my terms. I will oppress you, and the only way you will challenge me is on my terms. And I think it's time to completely reject that idea. Civil society in South Africa, on the 17th November last year, I was at a meeting, and this was one of the biggest organizations in our country, one which is seen to be very effective and is being remodeled across the continent. During this meeting, this was a project, a youth and local government project, and there were 14 people in the room. Of those 14 people, four were black. Of those four black people, I was the only black woman. Out of all the 14 people, I was the only one under 30. This is a youth and local government project. In all my wisdom, this was during the time Roads Must Fall was going on, race is at the forefront of the conversations that we have in all of a sudden. I ask, is it not ironic that in a country whose demographics look the way they look, this is what the room I'm in looks like? A very small question, but because whiteness is so fragile, because patriarchy is so fragile, because all of these things are so fragile, it became a huge deal. And I was told not to be emotional. Another gentleman who was in the room said the same thing as well. He wasn't told he was being emotional. So there was a lot of things that were going on there. There was race, there was gender, but then the executive director in question, you know, he just, you know, you child, you know, you must just. So there was a whole age thing going on there. And this brings us to the idea of being civil. You know, you look across the continent at our civil society, our big organizations, are they reflective of the demographics across the country? And then we go into the spaces where there is a lot of disruption and how this sense of civilness, you know, is also trying to reframe them to reinforce certain boundaries.
During the stuff that went on with the student movement, there was a lot of, there was a dominant narrative about how young people are suddenly fighting back and all of that. Across South Africa, the majority of the protests in the country, and we are known as the protest capital of the world, have always been led by young people. Why are they exceptionalized when they happen in certain confines? Why do we have empathy when there is police brutality there, when we have a long history of police brutality across our protests, you know? So it brings issues about when does it matter, which body matters, what does this body look like, you know? So I think this is some of the challenges that, we, that are being brought to us. We speak about our liberators, this idea that we come from colonial times and needed liberation. That was not a politics of liberation. We know that a lot of our movements were deeply patriarchal and all of those things. But we also recognize that the enemy lines were much more clearer then. It was black and white in the very figurative and very literal sense. Right now, as young people, we exist in a world, in a space in history, where there are so many different shades of gray. A deeper recognition of the many other forms of oppression that exist than once before. When we disrupt, it can be captured as well. And we should always be thinking about how do we move away from that. Sometimes we refer to the past and, you know, it's, it's a good lesson. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from there. But the reality is whether we like it or not, we occupy a different space in history, a different space in time. Some of the questions we have to ask ourselves about our movements are questions our parents have never had to ask of themselves. Some of what we have to do to actually be leading is things people actually never had to do. The ability to step back. The ability to recognize that I am being very disruptive and transgressive in this space. But at the same time, as a man, I am being heard over others. As a person of a particular age, I'm being heard over others. As a person of a particular class, I'm being heard over others. And that's what we often don't talk about when it comes to youth leadership. Critical, you should know when to step back. You should know that. We often talk about you know, poverty in terms of you know, the young suffering girl out there. You know, she's the face of poverty and all of that. We never talk about the John Smith who's living the good life. Whether we like it or not, John Smith's life is subsidized by her suffering. Whether you like it or not, for every time anybody is comfortable when you are doing disruptive work, somebody's being uncomfortable on your behalf. The work of disruption is not meant to be easy because social justice is not only out there. Social justice is here, what we're doing in our spaces. So sometimes we get caught up in this idea of we're going to change things out there, I'm going to do the huge thing. But within our movements, within how we interact with each other, we aren't reflecting those values. That's a huge part of transgressiveness. That's a huge part of disruption. So I think even just this idea of civil society itself, and we've seen where young people have had huge impact across the continent, it's when they disrupted the traditional civil society methods of operating. Sometimes we get caught up in the idea that the work is more important. If I call this out now, if I call out my comrade now, I'll be disrupting the work when actually it is part of the work. It's the oldest idea of the man in the mirror. It's the old idea of you know, the change beginning with yourself. It's all of those things. So that will be my beginning start, my starting point, and we shall continue the discussion going forward. Thank you both. So just to pick up on um, some of the issues, that, some of the kind of issues that have come, uh, great uh, presentations. Um, Siswa, you talked a bit about uh, how protests originating in Africa can also speak to, you know, to the powers in the West, etc. Um, so the, the links kind of between Africa and, and, you know, other parts of the world. What about links with movements within Africa? Can you tell us a bit about how 
um, one could learn, one movement could learn from another, or how they can co collaborate to meet similar goals, if they have even similar goals. Sure. I mean, I think one of the interesting narratives around the Arab Spring that's, that was silent was that it wasn't <coughs> an African movement. Whenever an, anyone spoke about the Arab Spring, it was always this Middle Eastern phenomenon. Oh, okay. All of a sudden, it's no longer African. Actually, if you trace many of the civil ferments, um, or rather, let's hope uncivil, um, they began in, in places like Uganda, uh, in Sudan, before, and then there was one after. And so I think the roots of that movement um, actually may be traced to what's happening in South Africa right now. And I think if we see this as a, um, an African trend, um, I think that's an interesting way of subverting this narrative that any time something is successful or any time young people stand up and actually bring, topple a dictator in Africa, there's always a reason why it's not quite an African phenomenon. So I would, I would actually link those two, um, those two movements and those two points in history and, and suggest that that's one interesting point of departure. But I think one of the problems also with, with the narrative of, of civil society is that it often re relies on this notion that politics is defunct and doesn't matter and so we need to go the civil society route because that's the way real change will happen in Africa. And it, that also sometimes relies on this notion that business is the only way that we can change, quote, Africa. But I think you've also got to look at what's happening politically in, in let's take Southern Africa at the moment, with uh, political movements that are slowly but surely beginning to challenge the dominant liberation narrative, um, being pretty brutally suppressed by these liberation movements. And I think you're starting to see in, in places uh, across Southern Africa new actual political formations uh, standing up to challenge these, these dominant liberation narratives. And I think the student movements in South Africa form part of that, more, that broader political trend um, that's taking place across the continent at the moment. Okay, Koket, so you said you had, um, you were problematizing this issue of, of society, civil society as civil, as, as a united front that was representing, um, you know, the people that it put, you know, purportedly um, was struggling for. So can you tell us, in your opinion, you know, if, if disruption is the key, how do you involve as many people as, as possible? How do you make that as democratic as possible? How do you mobilize people then to, um, to, to your cause? I would say that a large part of our understanding of some words and thinking um, is, is also deeply problematic, you know? There have been movements time and time before, but just because they didn't follow particular ideas of what democracy looks like doesn't mean they were ineffective. Do you know what I mean? So there's a whole lot of deconstruction that needs to happen in general about the things. But just to talk about the use of the a woman's body is a powerful symbol on the continent. There's issues there around how women, you know, respectability and all of that. There's also issues around how you're supposed to be, keep it away, how it's not under your control and all of those things. And therefore, naked protest has become, is a huge thing on the continent. Whether you in Kenya, Niger, there's a long history of women protesting that way. In South Africa, about two, three years ago, so we have townships, and then we have, so during apartheid, black people were shunted into these little townships, right? And there was one in this one called Soweto, that's where part of the 1976 stuff happened. There was a protest for sanitation, for adequate sanitation that side, and the women undressed. A lot of the narrative around that, even globally, there was, you know, whose mother is this? Who's what, what is this? Who's, you know, it was just very derogatory. Um, it was on the front page of the Sowetan, a newspaper called the Sowetan, and while well, the image went wild, I think New York Times and a couple of other places also published it. And then we, move, we fast forward to now. We fast forward to now, very recently, Rhodes University, the university currently known as Rhodes, rather, 
has did the same thing. There was a naked protest. They were protesting against the rape culture. This was found to be very radical. Why when a particular body in a particular confine does it, is it very radical? And when it's being done outside, it isn't, you know? And this is not a problem of the movement that's doing it. This is the spectator, the spectator's understanding of it. Because the problem we have is that a lot of the things we are fighting, whether racism, whether patriarchy, they reinvent themselves. The moment I say to you, you can't put up a sign that says, for whites only. What you start doing is you start choosing class. In South Africa, money is being used to keep people out of schools. Your SGB's school governing bodies increase the fees to still keep, white, to keep black people out. So it's, things keep reinventing themselves, you know? And for us, it's to say, how do we recognize this within our movements? And you actually actively root it out. You actually actively say that this exceptionalization when this, so you, this linking up that you're talking about, how are we connecting? Because that's how you're building the broad front, actually. Because these things aren't happening in isolation in a certain space. We're all feeling the impact. It's just like the university stuff. We all had to support it. We have to support it. I'm one of those people who couldn't go to university. I would have kids who, you know, would benefit from such a movement. So these things are not separate in the way they are being seen. But we go back to Frey's thing about, you know, separating the leaders from the people, why it's dangerous to do that. Because you cause these disconnections between movements. And that's the greatest challenge of building this broad front, you know? Because the dominant narratives actually break it apart, mm -hmm. reinforce those divisions, even when it's not necessary, even when they are actually not there. So, you, but, so you're saying, despite all these challenges, that youth movements do present kind of a, a more dynamic, a more um, inclusive way, or potentially could, in, uh, could be, could represent a more inclusive way of doing politics, of doing governance. But the, one of the main challenges to youth movements in general is the idea that sometimes they fail to articulate the, the, the concerns of people at, you know, at large, people who aren't potentially you know, having the same experience as them. Um, so this goes out to both of you. Do, do you think that youth movements as they are, considering the demographics of Africa at the moment, do they represent a kind of a shift in the way that governance, you know, or government accountability is, um, is being carried out? You've got this youth contingent who are a rising group, um, and regardless of all the, the you know, intersections, or the intersectional identities within the movements, that they're able to kind of present this challenge to, so, you know, quote unquote, bad, bad governance. I would say that they raise, they raise the questions that have never been asked before. Never before in South Africa have we had a conversation about patriarchy within our movements. And it's always been there. It's a consistent thing. But now it's a conversation that's out there. So actually not only is governance and spectators being challenged, but I would argue that even us within ourselves, within these movements, we're challenging ourselves to do better to go further, you know? And to, it needs to be kept up though, it needs to be kept up. I would actually say that, yeah, there's, there's never been a time where these challenges, are, these challenges of the intersectional identities, of the different identities, of the recognition that we are part of the same society, this oppressive society, but it oppresses us in different ways, has never been recognized on this scale before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also a question of where you look. If, if you're looking for youth civil society movements in the model of the way that they might happen in, in other places in the world, then you'll probably be disappointed. And I, I think many of those movements have been deeply ineffectual um, across the length and breadth of the continent. But if you're looking at different and more interesting places, if you're looking at the way that hip hop is being used to subvert political narratives in Senegal, uh, and has been for a long time and actually determines very serious elections and how young people are using that genre and art form as a way of influencing the way people speak and think about politics, then you're thinking, hmm, young people are actually doing some quite interesting and, quote, innovative uh, things in Africa. Um, but you're also looking at violence. Um, and this is, this is the thing. When we're dealing with some serious problems and some serious injustices. And so when you're looking at young people 
leading demonstrations against the Nkurunziza regime um, in Burundi, you're looking at a movement led by young people uh, standing up and being brutally repressed and oppressed. And the same goes if we look in Southern Africa, whether we're looking at journalists uh, being silenced for critiquing the Dos Santos regime in Angola, or we come right back to the South African movements who have been very critical of state power in South Africa, of the fact that uh, an ANC government which purports to stand on the liberation narrative would slaughter 34 mine workers um, that work for a company that's owned in Britain. And it's all of these kinds of debates that I think young people are putting at the forefront. And it's gonna be really interesting to watch given the way that communications are happening, but also the class dynamics associated with those communications, what will come of this new era of political ferment? I think one of the things that's quite interesting for me to think about is that liberation movements have tended to take up an inordinate amount of political space, and a politics challenging the neoliberal dogma that, that seems to be spreading across Africa hasn't yet emerged, but it looks to be in a, an embryonic state at the moment. And I wonder whether there will be political movements who can harness this, uh, this moment to actually level a serious challenge against the economic status quo that exists in Africa. Um, and I think that's one area to watch, and how, how movements outside of formal politics and inside formal politics play a role in that. I think the economic freedom fighters in South Africa is, is an interesting example <laughs> thereof. But hey, call me biased. <laughs> okay, we'll open it up to uh, questions on the floor. We'll take sets of three. So one here and Simakai, and one here. Thank you. Um, so I may cheat a little bit because I have two questions. Um, so the first one is, um, I think, one of the things you said at first, Cizue, was talking about nuance and talking about how you center your movement around this kind of totem. And I, and I want to hear from you about what happens when that nuance can like, erode some of what you're trying to do, right? In that when people start to focus on the totem as the thing and not the issues surrounding it and not what people are trying to convey through it, right? So this idea that when we now think about roads must fall, some people are saying, well, it's all about the statue, right? So how do you cr use that nuance, like use those symbols because those symbols are present and they're so important, but how do you also make sure that the uh, real issues, the, the issues that underlie it, are not lost? That we're still talking about decolonizing curricula and not just talking about a statue. So that's the first thing, like how do we deal with when nuance becomes destructive or a distraction? The second question is about that intersection between formal and informal politics. This idea that there are movements, political movements, that are outside of these formal institutions, these political parties, and how do they I suppose my question is, what does it look like when these informal political movements actually confront the political movements, the places where, and, and maybe this is my short-sightedness, where it seems like change can happen, right? The people who have the money or the resources or are building the infrastructure or whatever else, and the ones that can give us the things that, as young people, we're looking for. Um, how do we then cross over from being an informal movement, right, and confronting the more formal politics um, to, to gain more traction? Um, yes, I'd like to thank you both for a very fascinating discussion and um, for really kind of um, challenging and thoughtful remarks. Uh, my question actually follows on, I think, uh, from Rutendo's, which is, um, it's a question about how these movements travel um, and about also some of the risks of how movements travel because they carry with them a certain set of ideas, a certain set of narratives, a certain way of thinking. Um, and that can be both incredibly powerful, but it also has some baggage that comes along with it. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about the challenging of reconciling difference within quite broad-based movements. Um, so if you're trying to challenge some kind of hegemonic structure and your ideas travel, but within a new context, say in Oxford, there are different conceptions of race. There are different conceptions of the role of history, historical consciousness, or colonialism. Um, and so you have to kind of adapt 
capture context and reconcile difference in order to be effective. And I was just interested to hear more of your thoughts on that and some of the potential uh, pitfalls that come when movements travel. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got two points, uh, one for you, Sizwa. Maybe, I mean, despite all the efforts that you guys put out, uh, maybe there were some presentational issues with the whole campaign. I mean, I teach in another university, I presented this case, and there were people divided, and some of the people said that it's a guilt trip, whatever our ancestors did in China, opium trade, or India, mutiny, or Mao Mao, Kenya, or slavery, uh, why should we be held responsible for it? So I think there was an element of uh, presentation in a way that rather <coughs> roads must fall. I think it, if the roads must tell, I think that would have been a better story <laughs> so that other stories could have come in as well. Um, uh, and in, in your case, I, I mean, I'm one of those people who did some work on civil society. I, I know that nation state is a big issue. And I'm not saying that we go back to the empires, whether they were African empires or the British Empire, or we go back to the tribes, despite the fact we are in the most tribalized city in the world. But um, we are stuck with nation state. And I think what nation states have done in terms of so-called majoritarianism, exclusivity, ethnicity, whatever, they have been able to defy, uh, divide civil societies. I mean, at one moment we could say they're all Arabs, or they're all Africans, or they're all South Asians, but they're not. They're divided into these nations. And these nations, or the governments, their respective governments, have been very powerful in keeping their respective civil societies apart. So the ideals are shared. What I see in Syria, what I see in uh, Egypt, what I see in Morocco, what I see in Mauritania, it's very similar. But they're all divided. So I think civil societies have to go beyond these national borders, I don't know how, and gather the courage and momentum, momentum which is to come from below and has to come from the outside, from across the region. And this is where I think um, civil societies could make a difference, whether it is in reference to discrimination or you know, gender-based issues or class-based issues. I think the problem in the developing world, our post-colonial world, is that civil societies, wonderful idea, they're saying the same thing in almost every nation state, but they're totally divided. Look at India, Pakistan. Any part of the post-colonial world, there are these conflicts, and the states have been, have been able to keep these civil societies apart. So unless we cross those borders, national borders, somehow create the bridges, I think we'll be just voices, you know, in vacuum. Thank you very much. So just uh, there's three questions. One about totems and symbols and how do you get to the real reasons behind the, um, the movements or the real concerns behind the movements. Um, Simukai's question about how ideas travel and what the pitfalls are for when they travel. What is lost? What is gained when that happens? And the last question about um, how to build bridges beyond the nation state, beyond the, the clothes, the books, the family, um, the, or the nation. So excuse me. Sure. Um, in some ways, I would dispute this, this distinction between the so-called real issues and the statue, because I think that the statue and what it represents is the real issue as well. Um, what I think is important to realize is that questions about the curriculum, or questions about the fact that there are only, or were only in 2015, 24 black British students accepted into the undergraduate system are linked to the values that the university espouses. So I think what we need to try to do, and I think this is perhaps where the conversation should go, is showing the links between these different things and saying the statue is a litmus test in my view. Right, because it's really easy for these institutions in their glossy prospectuses to have images of smiling black students laughing next to you know, people from various parts of the world. And then you get to Oxford and you're like, um, where did the prospectus go? Because I'm not <laughs> seeing any of this here. And so these institutions are experts and they have these very well-funded PR teams presenting themselves and they'll do they will, 
think we're being sabotaged <laughs> as we speak. Uh, um, so, so the danger is that you, you, you allow them the loophole to say, okay, we've done this little transformation thing where we've, we've brought in more black students, or we've now brought in a black professor. And this is important, but you're then not pushing them on their fundamental values. Because why would you want inclusivity in a space that's designed to be rigged against you? This notion of diversity, we don't want diversity in a space that glorifies people who brutalized our ancestors. Quite frankly, you can keep your diversity if that's your definition. But what I do think is an important point is um, how the narrative then gets taken. And I think the interesting thing that happened here was when the media picked it up, um, and the way that the media was able to paint Roads Must Fall as this not iconoclastic movement, but as this group of irrational students who wanted to pull things down. And I do think that there, there was a danger, or there is a danger, when you simplify all these debates into one symbol that you can then get painted as if you don't have any nuance behind your arguments. When you can talk till you're blue in the face about all the nuances, but the media narrative matters. And I think that was something that the South African movement was able to counter because the political dynamics were different. But as soon as the media sort of captured that narrative, it was very difficult to, and is, and, and the movement is ongoing, to, to continue to have those conversations about how it actually really is very nuanced. It's just that the statue is a symbol for many of these other things. So yes. Um, then in terms of your question, uh, Simukai, I think it's an interesting experiment and we do need to be quite honest about some of the ways in which um, the analogies don't hold. And I think that in some ways was, was the point of the campaign to, to see if we implanted this, this narrative and this rhetoric and this strategy, how would it work? And sometimes it is square pegs and round, round holes and you think, wow, okay, that's interesting. The conception of race is totally different in Britain to what it is in South Africa. Um, and you have to try to amend your strategy. Um, I think the, the point that Coquetso raised as well about uh, that many of these have, have um, fallen victim to internal power dynamics. And that operates very differently in a space like Oxford than it does in a space like Southern Africa because the power dynamics are different in the two different places. So there are constant struggles between where the focus of the movement should be given that we're in a space like this. And in fact, it turns out the focus should be different, uh, different in some cases in a place like this. So I think those are still things that are kind of being worked out and those tensions haven't quite resolved themselves yet and it's those ambiguities that we're struggling with but that I think are also interesting in the debate to, to be like, oh, okay, interesting. So that worked in South Africa but hmm, in Britain there's a different context, in the States there's a different context as well. And finally, to come on to um, your first point about the, the packaging, as it were, and, and this relates also to Rue's point. Um, on the other hand, I do, I do want to push back to some extent you know, over this notion that saying roads must fall made people feel uncomfortable and because in some ways that was, that was the point and that was the aim, is that we wanted those academics and, and those people not to feel at home and we wanted to disrupt their feeling of comfort in these spaces. Now, the Telegraph, the Telegraph took that and, and did interesting things with it that I don't think anyone would have expected. But at the same time, um, I think this is an interesting feature of what is happening on the African continent and, and how we can use it here to make people feel specifically uncomfortable, to disrupt spaces and, and, and just leave the disruption there. It's not our job to make, to make it right again. Um, because as you spoke about, you know, this ancestor business and it was other people's ancestors, true. But I didn't see anyone deleting their bank accounts with the, the wealth that was accrued. 
Um, so, you know, we can't keep all the benefits that our ancestors looted and then turn around and say, ooh, we don't want any of the costs. Yeah. Uh, if that's the case, then um, can we please have Oriel College's donations back? <laughs> then we can speak about ancestors and benefits. So, in some ways, the aim was exactly that. But the political dynamics being as they are here, um, it hasn't always been as easy to score victories given our um, unwillingness to, to budge. But I take your point. Okay, so my responses. I'm gonna first start with actually what you say to see is where about the comfort, right? In many instances, the pressure of keeping the peace is put on those who are oppressed. At some point, the oppressors have got to admit that actually, this moment, this moment of my discomfort is somebody else's lifetime. Yeah, so I think we, we need to stop doing that. We need to stop putting it on the other to make others feel comfortable. There, there's no more space for that. To link the two about the nation state and what he was saying about the movement and all of that. So I would argue that civil, while civil society has not been effective in crossing the border, disruptive uncivil society has. We saw the link up between the Rhodes Must Fall movement, Black Lives Matter. You know, there's been, they didn't see it as a race. It was recognized that white supremacy is a global phenomenon and people have connected in amazing ways on that. Um, the movements have been spending time with each other, sending people out, and there's also been these actions of, these symbolic actions, Brie Newsom acknowledging these different movements, you know what I mean? So I would actually say that uncivil society has done actually quite well, and this also should raise questions about civil society and its ineffectiveness, so to speak. So we're going to have to conclude it there, but um, if you just help me in thanking our two speakers. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. you said you didn't want to go first because you were nervous, but why are you nervous? It was brilliant.